I swear next week the new intros with Corey. I swear next week. I'm 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 so on it. Just been I've been busy. Oh, hold on. I'm not getting sound on you. Hang on. There now I think. Do I have you now? Uh, you yes, tell me. Go. Yes, now I have you. My bad. Sorry, I didn't push a certain button. That's how professional this show is. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll get the Corey stuff done next week. Uh, in any case, uh, you know what? I, I wanted to start the show today, too, with a, a little bit of a, um, just kind of a tribute. A, a very close friend of mine passed away, uh, actually, a few days after Prince. And um, a Martin Zweibach, and a, a really an amazing screenwriter with a legendary career, one of the most prolific people I've ever known. Uh, he wrote some of the top-rated episodes of Kung Fu, TV show, wrote and produced uh, The Ultimate Solution of Grace Quigley with uh, Catherine Hepburn and Nick Nolte. And uh, lots of other, you know, directed a couple of things. He's just a, really an amazingly prolific guy. And uh, he passed away uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I will miss him dearly, but his work lives on. And I would urge people, you know, if you haven't seen The Ultimate Solution to Grace Quigley, you ought to see it. It's uh, the only... It's Oscar nominated. It's the only film that exists in a writer's cut. Because he and Anthony Harvey had a falling out during the making of the film, and Martin took re- took command of all the footage and recut it. And uh, Leonard, if you look it up in, in Malton, uh, you know Malton's like, yeah, it's the only film that ever was ever turned into a writer's cut. And his cut is actually better than Harvey's. Harvey was kind of on the tail end of his career at the time after Lion and Winter and all that stuff. But um, the great the great part of this that I wanted to get to was uh, Martin, e- despite being you know a successful writer with a long television pedigree behind him and some really interesting movies. Um, um, when he was trying to get uh, Grace Quigley made, he basically circumvented the whole normal, I'm going to go through my agent process. Swifty Lazar was his agent, by the way. Swifty Lazar with the big Coke bottle glasses who used to throw the mega Oscar party, you know. One of the biggest agents in Hollywood history. Swifty was Martin's agent. Martin could have played the game. Um, but it, you know what Martin did to get Catherine Hepburn attached? He went to her estate and he threw his script over the gate. With a letter. And, and she called him. Really? Yes. That's She hilarious. read it and loved it and called him. It's not, I've never heard of that working ever. And that's Catherine Hepburn. And that's Catherine Hepburn. You know? So, um, yeah. I mean, you know, Martin was just a gutsy, ballsy guy. and um, I would love to know what that letter said. It basically said, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know he's, he's written this. He's told the story many times. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm a huge admirer. And he was writing a book about this whole thing anyway when he passed. But, uh, you know, I'm a huge admirer. I think this would be perfect for you. And, uh, you know, please give it a read. And, you know, it was a very sweet, uh, cordial letter and very personal. And she responded to it. It's, I mean, you know, it's just something you, people do and people think about doing and dream about doing and talk about doing. It never works. You usually get chased off by Dobermans or something when people try to do that kind of thing. You know, he's one of those guys who <laughs> had... <laughs> bow fingery. He had a great career, yeah. a long-running career... Career full of great projects, yeah. earned a lot of respect, yep. but yet you know he never really got the popular due that he, that yeah. was coming to him because yep. you know the Hollywood is filled with guys like that. They have great long running careers. Yeah. They work on a lot of great shows. They write a lot of good movies. And Martin was one of those guys. He was a wonderful guy. And you you you've met Martin. I have met Martin. Yeah. He's just a fantastic guy, very down to earth and uh, unbelievably prolific. He would uh, he would always say to he, every once in a while he'd say to me, "Go, have I ever, have I ever given you this script to read?" And, uh, you know, I, I, I always thought I'd read everything he'd written. And it was just, he, he had so much material. I mean, his, uh, his backlog of scripts is just enormous. And uh, so many good movies in there. I hope, I, I hope a, a chunk of them eventually someday get made. So um, some really, really good ones in there. Anyway, all right, let's, uh, let's plan. Nobody, nobody of significance has, uh, has well, of relative significance. People are still dying every week. But this, uh, this death of Palooza thing seems to have arrested just a little bit uh, right now. So we're in a brief pause before everybody just starts kicking the bucket again. I'm, I'm assuming probably early summer. Isn't that when most people decide to die, early yes, summer? Yes, that's when the, most people yeah. decide. Yeah. To die. Yeah. All right. Very good. So uh, let's, uh, Mark, let's, let, you know, shall we start eh, with, shall what? We st- what? Eh. Shall we start with television today? Sure. Let's start with television. What do you say, buddy? It's your right. show. 
It's not my show. It's our show. But let's uh, let's let's start with some TV. So uh, we got a big old box set that normally would be the kind of thing that we get around the end of the year. But uh, no, no, Paramount CBS. They are giving us a, an early uh, holiday gift with the complete series, all 119 episodes on 31 discs of The Untouchables. That is the original series with Robert Stack that, of course, inspired the Brian De Palma film starring Kevin Costner. Uh, and uh, this is all about Elliot Ness chasing down uh, Al Capone and, uh, you know, Lucky Luciano and whoever else was running afoul of his G-Men during that, uh, that legendary era. Um, the, uh, you know what? It's amazing how well this show actually holds up. It's got, it's got a kind of a... It, it definitely feels like a show of the era. Like all of those, uh, you know, it's a little pre-Dragnet, a little pre-the FBI, pre-Quinn Martin, but it definitely feels like it's, uh, it's veering into all of that stuff. Um, it, do, it has sort of a surreal, quasi-post-noir feel to it, but yet it's still really, really well-written, and the acting is terrific, amazing cast. And Robert Stack, man... We forget what a great actor he was. That he was just he's he was cool. the, he was so cool. Yeah, he's so, cool. anyway, hard boiled uh, guy. The, the weirdest thing out here is that the, the special feature, which is an episode of the Lucy Show called Lucy the Gun Mall, I guess because they own it and it's Lucy acting like a gangster. But it's a very strange thing to throw onto a giant box set of The Untouchables. There are no other extras on here. Very peculiar. I would have expected at least a few things. Anyway, otherwise, 31 discs, 119 episodes in uh, two keep cases. Seasons one through three on uh, the first uh, keep case and season four on the, uh, the other one in a nice box set. It's sharp. Really good. Can't go wrong. Wade, we have um, from the CW, the good folks at the CW, the truly horrible show Beauty and the Beast – which uh, actually not the not the one with uh, not the one with Linda Hamilton no. and uh, Ron Perlman. Yeah. This is one uh, now. This is the CW version of Beauty and the Beast, which means that the reason he said <laughs> the reason why the guy is a beast is he's like he's impossibly handsome, but has a scar <laughs> on his face. <laughs> He's got like one scar down his cheek. He's like the handsomest guy you'll ever see in your life. One scar. He's a beast. This is just horrible. <laughs> you know, and it stars this woman, and she's trying to solve the murder of her mother, whatever. This thing got canceled, so uh, uh, new episodes do start in June, but that's it. Um, but otherwise, this Too thing funny. is just a joke. So uh, if you're a, a CW completist, <laughs> in which case I feel sorry for you, you may want to check out um, Beauty and the Beast, the third season on uh, DVD. We also have the complete for the season of Newhart. This is not the Bob Newhart show, but this is Newhart, the one where he runs the, uh, the inn. And uh, you know, it's also very funny. Uh, it's a very funny show. Peter Scolari's on it, and uh, you know, Tom Post is so funny. Mary Fran is the wife. Uh, this show was funny, not as funny as the, as the uh, his first show, the Bob Newhart show, which I grew up on and absolutely completely loved. Uh, anyway, twenty four episodes, Emmy nominated, Newhart fifth season. Also, we have uh, Dolly Parton's Coat of Many Colors. Now, this was kind of a big deal when it came out. Um, uh, quite recently, and uh, because of the little girl who they cast as little Dolly Parton, and it was a nationwide search, and it was a big, big deal. In fact, I think Dolly was the one who told the little girl that she got the part, and it became like this kind of viral video of Dolly breaking to this young girl that she was going to play Dolly in a movie. And, um, you know, what can you say? It's Dolly Parton. It's very uplifting with a little bit of hardship there, very rags to riches, you know, Dolly grew up in in, uh, in the Smoky Mountains, which are in Tennessee, and so you know, there's a lot of loss there, a lot of love there. It's a very uplifting story, but it is Dolly Parton, and everybody loves Dolly. Got to respect Dolly, and Gerald McRaney's in this, Ricky Schroeder's in this, and uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's cute. Rick, Rick's in that? Yes, he is. Really? By the way, he's back to Ricky now. I know. I still call him Rick. I, well, no, he wanted to be called Rick. Yeah, but and then somehow that didn't take. <laughs> now he's back to Ricky. Yeah, whatever. So, Coat of Many Colors, the Dolly uh, Parton. Uh, I, you know, I, there, I wish there was more uh, extras on this, like maybe a commentary by uh, the director, Stephen Herrick, or even Dolly herself, but there's just a featurette and a couple of deleted scenes. But uh, anyway, there you go for your Dolly fans. And I get it, Dolly fans. Dolly's cool. So, uh, hello, Dolly. I don't get it. Anyway, um... I actually co-wrote a sketch years ago. We had a we had a sketch comedy group at UCLA, and uh, Dave Weishart and I were part of that, and a whole bunch of, and we we had a sketch that was a mock 
commercial for a new production of Hello Dolly, and I'm trying to remember how he wrote it, starring the Dalai Lama, Salvador Dali, and Dolly Parton, and and like three others. It was actually the, 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 it was very funny. It was really quite funny. Yeah, see that that's the stuff you think you think is hilarious <laughs> when you're like you know you're 20. <laughs> you realize this. then 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 you become like 35. Uh, you realize it's lame. Yeah, it's true. All right, so in 1973, there was a television production, a British television production, through um, uh, the Associated Television Limited, which is a company that doesn't exist anymore, of uh, Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. And uh, it was wonderful and lovely. It starred uh, a really remarkable cast. It starred then-married couple Lawrence Olivier and Joan Plowright. Uh, along with Jeremy Brett, who had just about nine years earlier been uh, in My Fair Lady and who would some decades later play uh, Sherlock Holmes on television. So Jeremy Brett continues to be a really amazing and chameleon-like British actor. Uh, but it is, uh, it is Olivier playing Shylock, which is really uh, the deal in this. It, he, just, he just kills it. One of the best performances of Shylock you will ever see. Uh, shy of uh, Dustin Hoffman, who continues to be, uh, I think in the eyes of many people, uh, the quintessential Shylock when he performed it. I think he was on the West End. might have been Broadway. But there was a revival where he just apparently blew the doors off of, uh, off of Merchant of Venice. So anyway, but Olivier is tremendous. This is a 1973 adaptation that was uh, very, very well received and well, uh, well produced at the time. And, uh, you know, Joan Plowright, seeing her just a little bit younger, is a delight. Uh, I, I'm very poorly exposed to young Joan Plowright, and she is just <laughs> terrific. So. You know, there's, th- if I ever uh, make a porn, make a porno film, yeah. I want my, the woman in the film to be called Plowright. Thanks for that. Don't Thanks. you think that it's just it's just yeah. you open it up, man? I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's the way to. By the way, that's you know, the way to really drag the show down. You Thank know, when you. I was growing up, you know, you know, Lawrence Olivier is one of the most venerated, respected actors of all time, yes. stage and and film. Yes. And so when I grew up, you know, Lawrence Olivier, Lawrence Olivier, he's oh my god, he's the Mount Rushmore. Then I realized that people, his friends, as as would be his wand because yeah. his name is Lawrence sure. would call him Larry mm-hmm. and the idea that Lawrence Olivier sure Mount Rushmore in terms of actors right. on stage and screen yeah. was called Larry yeah. which just seems like so base uh-huh. couldn't handle it do you, do you think that um, Captain America's uh, uh, Civil War is going to wind up being the most successful Marvel film of all time yes I think it could be I do I do I do you it's know why like I, it, you know it? what it, 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 it's a combination of the fact that it's, it's good yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, also, the fact that uh, people were turned off by Batman versus Superman, and they 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 want a palate cleanser. They want to know what it feels like to but like a superhero film. I also feel like of all of the team up movies, and we haven't had Justice League yet, but of all, but certainly Batman and Superman is the beginning of a team up, which kind of tanked. And the Avengers was fun, and then the second Avengers film was kind of a dud. And I think this feels like I think people are watching this like, well, that's the Avengers film I wanted to see, because this is it. Like, it's more character driven, right? It's more. It's not. Oh my gosh, here comes like an army of aliens. We have to team up and you know have a giant CGI battle for forty five minutes at the end of the movie before. Hey, surprise! We save the Earth. Like, there's more darkness and there's more. That's right. You know, it's, I it's, like it. It's good. It's good. It is good. I think. I think. Uh, on, come back in a month and you realize it was the biggest Marvel. Yep, film. I think so. Well, anyway, uh, a couple of couple of bits, uh, old and new comics here. The Jim Gaffigan Show, season one, funny. from TV Land. I love it him. is funny. He's good, isn't he? I, I think he's hilarious. He's just the best. Yep, I, yeah, he's I, great. There's a whole, you know, he's just so unassuming. The only, the only thing better than bacon is more bacon. <laughs> <laughs> he's got this whole run on bacon. You can hear it on YouTube. It, he's got this whole run on bacon. That's really well. Funny. His his hot pockets routine is still one of the the, the best things I've ever heard. Too. It's just it's, it, because they are they're disgusting. It's, you know who who. I used to love Hot Pockets when they first came out. I was like, whatever, ten well, years old. I used to love Hot Pockets. Great supporting cast. I had too. a Hot Pocket like a year ago for whatever reason. Adam, they're horrible. Adam Goldberg is great casting on this. I got to say, Adam Goldberg is just like the perfect, uh, perfect kind of neurotic sensibility to counterbalance Jim Gaffigan. Uh, but you know, you also got to Ashley Williams, Michael Ian Black. It's a, it's a, it's a good show. It's a very good show, and it's very him. You know, it stays true to him. So I think it's a good show. It's been around, it'll be around for a while. And then uh, Bob Hope, Entertaining the Troops. Uh, this is a couple of very, very famous and popular Bob Hope shows, um, which, uh, you know, if you, if you grew up as we did, watching a lot of these Bob Hope shows where he's uh, 
just doing his doing his shtick and uh, entertaining the troops and doing his USO shows. Um, you 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 know before he started doing those really bad TV specials, uh, it, the guy just had a way. You know the troops loved him and it was just like he was like an American tradition. And then he would go and host the Oscars and. It was like, I, I couldn't imagine what life would be like without Bob Hope. He was just an institution. It was amazing. Anyway, uh, so this is a couple of fabulous shows, Entertaining the Troops, and lots of great guest stars uh, who pop in, Ursula Andress and Romy Schneider and uh, Lola Falana and uh, Connie Stevens. It's, just, it's, it's really a lot of fun. Uh, so this is from Time Life. You want to check out Entertaining the Troops, Bob Hope. Uh, really, really great. Uh, American institution. Did you... <laughs> Did you have you ever been to that church in North Hollywood that Bob Hope built for his wife? I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, so you really had no idea. So no. there's a church. Yeah. I think it's like Lancashire and something. Yeah. And because you know Bob Hope was a legendary, the the guy cheated on Dolores. Well, that, total that's, sex that's, machine. That's only been recently kind of divulged. Well, here's the thing. You know the. So uh, Dolores, yeah. by the way, knew all this. Yeah. And so Bob Hope said, "Listen, I, if I built you a church." Because she was, she was very, you know, yeah. very, uh, she was a you know, worshiping Catholic. Yeah. If I build you a church, will that make up for all of my sins? <laughs> so literally, the church that's on Lancashire. I did not know this. And it's right off the Ventura Freeway. I've got the cross Really? Street. Yes. Bob Hope built that church for her to, to, to assuage as, her, you know, whatever. As recompense, yes, repentance. Yes, correct. Mia culpa yes. for you know all what, of his you indiscretions. Talk, I'm, 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 I'm going to Google this. I'm going to find it because it, it's the truth. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, last two last two TV shows then. Uh, Scream, the TV series, the complete first season uh, from MTV, is perhaps single handedly responsible. Nah, not yet, not much. But I would probably hope that to. I'd like to pretend that it is single handedly responsible for MTV deciding to go back to music videos for the first time in like 20 years. Uh, or 30 years, however however long it's been. So, uh, you know what? It's just, uh, this doesn't really need to be a series. This was a series of movies. It ran the co- ran its course. And I, uh, trying to kind of el- make the thing more modern, bring it back into the YouTube generation, I, I'm sorry, it just uh, doesn't really work. It, uh, it, you know what it is? It, it, it's so desperately trying to cater to that audience that needs a Scream series yeah. that like it's precipitating incident is like a YouTube video yeah it's not good it's just not that and uh, more interesting and I'm still I gotta be honest I'm still undecided as to how I feel about this is uh, War and Peace the complete miniseries which I did not see when it aired and uh, you know here's uh, this is a uh, this is a BBC production which uh, is released on Anchor Bay through the Weinstein Company so everybody's got their fingers in this um there have been many different versions of War and Peace made, and there is obviously the glossy Hollywood version from whatever it was, 1956 or 7, uh, 55, somewhere in there, uh, with uh, Audrey Hepburn, which is extremely truncated, very glossy, and uh, not terribly good. And because uh, it's a huge book, right? You know, War and Peace is a course. big honking thing. And then there's the Sergei Bondarchuk uh, film from like 1968, I believe it was, which is the, the Big Mama. That thing is like, you know, 11 hours long, whatever it is. Uh, it takes a whole day. I actually went... I've seen that projected, by the way. I went to the Egyptian theater a few years ago when they had a special screening of it. It had a lunch and a dinner break. I uh, spent the whole day sitting there with like 30 or 40 other people watching War and Peace at the Egyptian theater. And it is an enormous film. And it's a little funky in 60s. It's got a little groove to it. Um, but I'll tell you this. Uh, Sergei Bondarchuk spent $100 million in the late 60s on this thing, which would be the equivalent of like... $600 million today. It is an obnoxious amount of money. It is arguably, pound for pound, probably the most expensive film ever made. And it is because he actually restages in detail entire battles uh, from Napoleon's campaigns. It, there's no CGI in 1968. It's just, ent- it's just literally tens of thousands of soldiers sprawled across miles and miles of land and, and organized through walkie-talkies as the camera pans across them. It's astonishing. And so I have that in my mind when I'm looking at uh, the Paul Dano, Lily James, James Norton cast in War and Peace, which is not as expensive or as opulent, but which, and obviously being told in English, feels a little bit less authentic, uh, but it is... It is a very Downton Abbey. It is a very Downton Abbey approach to War and Peace, which I appreciate, but it isn't Tolstoy. So I'm still trying to decide whether or not I like the, uh, the Anglicization, the Downton Abbeyization of War and Peace. And, of course, Lily James was, was on Downton Abbey. 
so I'm trying to figure out whether or not I sort of approve of that or if I feel like that is uh, an impure uh, way of, of telling the tale. Anyway, it is still, by any measure, quite good. And uh, I don't know if we have had the definitive telling of that enormous, massive book. I'm not even sure if it's possible. But this certainly does hold its own alongside uh, previous versions, especially the, uh, the misbegotten uh, 1950s version with Audrey Hepburn, which is worth seeing only because of Audrey Hepburn. So anyway, that is on Blu-ray, and it is six hours long, and it is a rather brisk six hours. Uh, so, Mark, what have you found out about that church? You know, it's called the uh, St. Charles Borromeo Church on uh, uh, Lancashire and Moore Park. Of course it is. <laughs> but here's the thing. Every, yes, he cheated big time. He was a big cheater. Yeah. But uh, I am looking for something that confirms that he had that church built for her mm-hmm. so that she would uh, put up with his cheating. Well, I <laughs> I, uh, having trouble. Of fi- I'm, I now everybody knows that Bob and Dolores live by that by the church. They helped build the church. It was his home parish. They lived a short they lived a short distance from that church. Um, but I'm looking for the uh, the smoking gun um, website that says yeah. that he had the church built because she couldn't stand the cheating anymore, and that was the trade off. Mm. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I had never heard that story actually. Bob Taylor told me that story. Isn't that amazing. Wow. Bob Taylor told me that Bob story. Taylor. You told me a Bob thing last week that still has me laughing. I, I can't say. I know it. we can't we can't, can't share the story on the show, but uh, Bob, of course, who did the uh, the early intros for this show for quite some time, and uh, he's still a very very funny man. Uh, and then really quickly, I just want to uh, you know we we love the people over at uh, MHZ, which I used to miss uh, pronounce or miss uh, mislabel as megahertz. It's MHZ. Uh, who do they bring all the uh, foreign language drama over onto DVD all that stuff all those great dramas that air in uh, Germany and France and Scandinavia and Italy and elsewhere and uh, most of them you know uh, procedurals cop procedurals but uh, some really interesting stuff and you know what this is one that is completely unusual for them Uh, Inspector Rex season one Vienna this is a this is an Austrian series uh, about a cop dog, about a German shepherd that is uh, essentially a you know police dog. Doggy. It, yeah, it's uh, kind of crazy, unusual, and uh, I, uh, I, I I kind of you know what? In a, there's a part of me that feels like this would be so much better if it were like an American series, and if it were funny, and if it had uh, John Shuck. Uh, John Shuck. You know, John Shuck, like... Uh, Holmes and Yo-Yo. Yeah, it just, it just feels like this should, should have been a 70s series with John Shuck and a, and a, and a big, uh, you know, like a big slobbery dog or something. Um, Doggy! Yeah, but anyway, uh, the guy's paired up with another inspector, and uh, it, it's a little lighthearted, but it's, uh, it's also actually quite well conceived. But the sensibilities, like the whole Austrian tone, I'm not... I, it, it, I'm not sure I really get into it anyway, but it's uh, it's an interesting idea. But I kind of feel like it would be better as an American series with le- you know just sillier, goofier. Maybe that's just because I can't take movies with like TV shows with dogs seriously. You're hoping that the Zucker brothers come out of retirement and do a Police Squad type show. I am with a crazy that's dog. I am. Oh, that would be the best. And then uh, we also have the uh, the wonderful uh, Don Mateo. Three more sets: thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. Uh, Don Matteo, of course, the uh, crime-solving Italian priest. And I have to say, this is a case where I don't want this story told on American television because it would wind up like the Father Dowling mysteries. You remember that with Tom Bosley? Yeah, with Tom Bosley. Oh, my gosh. Che- yeah, but Tom oh, Bosley was cheesy. This, this guy, no. no, no, no. This guy is way more badass than Tom Bosley. Oh, way more badass. Yeah, no, I mean, he's, he's, he's sharp. Like, he's great. And Terrence Hill... Um, is phenomenal in the uh, in the lead. He's just absolutely perfect. So, no, this is uh, this is really really good stuff. Really well written. Really really smart episodes. Uh, very 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 uh, tightly tightly plotted. Um, a lot of fun stuff. Riveting. If you've never seen Don Mateo, there's a reason why this show is just hugely hugely popular, and uh, and rightfully so. So you definitely want to check it out. It's in Italian, English subtitles. Just want to remind you of that. This is an Italian show, but it's really really good. And it, it despite the subtitles, if it, it's just it's as gripping as any procedural you'll ever see. So uh, a lot of really fun stuff there. Sets 13, 14, and 15. You're gonna want to binge watch this sucker. Wait, I'm, uh, I'm on Hinge because I don't, I, I don't care about this show. Yeah. So I'm on Hinge. You're on Hinge. I don't even know what that is. It's a dating app where you do the swiping. We talked about this last week. Yeah. Hinge is another one. So this woman, who I will not uh, email back because she's 53 years old, but um, look what she has as her profile picture. 
Uh, Prince? Yes. Okay. That's her profile picture, Prince. I don't understand Because Prince why. died, she probably put that up there to, you know, All right. represent. But she's 53, so I'm not going to okay. uh, date her or even talk to her ever. Okay, fine. Yeah, whatever, <laughs> I, I, I guess. All right, Mark, let's uh, yes. get into some classic movies. Or old movies or catalog titles, whatever we want to call them. What would you like to talk it. about first? Uh, get, let, let's hit the criterion. Knock the criterion out. And then I'll go the... I'll, I'll ram through some uh, olive titles. Uh, Nicholas Ray directed Humphrey Bogart in In a Lonely Place. And this is just a classic film noir. Gloria Graham is also in this. And, uh, you know, Bogart plays uh, this uh, tr- troubled... He's, he's a screenwriter. And he's suspected of murder. And um, Gloria Graham plays this... Uh, the neighbor who, you know... Kind of, they kind of fall in love. And so this was a bit of a departure, I think, for, um, for Bogart. He, did, he would occasionally kind of get a little dark uh, in his career, but this to me is really the one where he kind of gave almost really the most full-bodied, I have to say, and darkest performance of his career. You know, guy's very down on his luck, and uh, he, you know, there's a certain emotional depth that Bogart is attempting here that you know we all like Bogart as the you know the guy who has all the answers and and s- smokes the cigarettes and in ways that the French New Wave just love to imitate but here in In the Lonely Place uh, I really think he went to interesting depths uh, and I think he was a it was a total winner it's from 1950 it's a 2k digital restoration but again it's a, it's an old black and white film it's you know 66 years old so you know you can't expect much from that uh, audio commentary by uh, Dana Pollan, very good film scholar, like that a lot. Uh, also, Nicholas Ray, obviously a very famous director. Um, there is a documentary here called uh, "I'm a Stranger Here Myself" about Nicholas Ray, and new interviews with um, with a biographer about Gloria Graham. And so, uh, yeah, in a lonely place, very interesting film, um, one of Bogart's most distinctive and deepest and darkest performances. So I would definitely check that out in a lonely place. Very nice. Um, we've got a bunch from Olive. We love the people at Olive. They always pick really interesting work. And, uh, you know, this is a... The, Olive mostly does... They, they mine licenses from uh, 20th Century Fox and other studios out of their catalogs. But every so often, they will, they will grab something that is just... Uh, that is, you know, current and contemporary, and they snatch it out from under everybody else. And this is one of them. Uh, the Major by uh, Russian director Yuri Bikov. This is really a hell of a movie. Reminds me a lot of uh, Leviathan, the, uh, the the Russian film from a, a couple great of years film. ago, which is a tr- tremendous and a tremendous screenplay. Didn't we give that best screenplay or something? Uh, we gave it something. I think we gave it. I think we gave it a screenplay award because uh, that's a great movie. I think one for best whale carcass. This is a similar thing, and uh, let me just say, there's a for some reason. Uh, somebody could maybe explain this to us. They're, Russian films just are not very... They don't have happy endings. They're not, they're, they're not funny. There are no Russian comedies. They're about bleak, horrible, miserable, desolate things. Because that's Russia. It, that it's just a reflection. Look, when, when, the, when the Soviets first started developing film, yeah. right, and you got into Battleship Potemkin, yeah. like all of their early films, it seems, is all about like revolution. Yeah, it is. You know, because that's what the people were going through at the time. Somebody just needs to really just airdrop some Prozac on that country or something. Anyway, uh, The Major is about a guy who, um, about a policeman who accidentally hits and he's driving across the most desolate place in the world. He, he kills a, a young boy. And it is about the, the hit and run, the cover up, the, all the stuff, all of the intrigue that uh, dovetails out from that. And it is a tremendously well written, incredibly well acted, really a powerful movie. And I'm shocked that this hasn't gotten uh, sort of more traction elsewhere, but it is definitely worth checking out. Uh, the Major, it is, a, it is a really good film, and I hope Yuri Bikoff gets, uh, some, gets some attention for this because, uh, you know, he's a good, good director and deserves some more attention. Uh, the uh, other films, Unlikely Heroes, uh, a film by Peter Luisi, which was uh, a, an entry in the Locarno Film Festival. And uh, this, is, uh, the, this is a Swiss-German co-production from a couple of years ago that also seems to have missed the, uh, any substantial exposure internationally, apart from that uh, appearance at the Locarno Film Festival. But uh, it is, you know, it's not as impressive as the Russian film, but it is, uh, it is still good, and I could probably see this getting an American remake somewhere down the line as well. Um, it is, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a female midlife crisis movie, and uh, it, it's 
pretty touching, actually. It really it doesn't it doesn't go in all those kind of light directions that you would expect an American film to. But if it were remade, I'm sure it probably would. But anyway, really nicely uh, directed by Peter Luisi, who also co-wrote it, and uh, some lovely performances, especially by Esther Gemsch, who plays the uh, the lead. Really quite nice. So um, also touches on a lot of contemporary issues that are unique to Germany and to Switzerland and Europe in particular in the in the you know the refugee era. Uh, Try and Get Me uh, stars Frank Lovejoy and Kathleen Ryan. This was made in 1950. Um, a this is a, a this is a a noir, but it is a certain kind of noir. It's one of those noirs that feels almost post noir. You know what I mean? It's almost it's no longer. It feels almost more like an angry young man English film. It feels grittier. It feels more on location. It feels more. Like almost docudrama like. Those are good things. And those are good things. And uh, 1950 is pretty early to start getting those. Most of those things come kind of after On the Waterfront. On the Waterfront is what really kind of opened up that particular genre. But anyway, this is based on a novel uh, called The Condemned. And um, it's, uh, it is, uh, it, this definitely really kind of gets under your skin. It's based on actual events. And it uh, deals with a guy who is uh, drawn into a kidnapping plot that goes completely off the rails. And uh, it, is, uh, it is very compelling and uh, quite a nice rediscovery. Frank Lovejoy, if you're not familiar with him, quite a hell of an actor back in the day. So uh, really worth it. And then uh, this is one that just is, is really to, to absolutely die for. Dead Pigeon on Beethoven Street. When you hear a title like that, what do you think, Mark? Dead Pigeon on Beethoven Street. It's going to be a, a, a coming-of-age mafia drama. Now, who, who, what, what, director, what director would direct a movie called Dead Pigeon on Beethoven Street? There's only one director who would put his name on a film. Well, here's the thing, though. Like it, 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 it sounds like a parody film. That's the thing. But actually, it's, it's, it's a Sam Fuller movie. There you go. That's but it. It, sounds like a, it sounds like a silly parody. Yeah, but Sam Fuller... Dead Pigeon on Beethoven Street? Sam Fuller himself is kind of a silly parody. No, Sam I mean, Fuller, loves, he's badass. Yeah, he is, buddy. But there's something really kind of just entertaining about him anyway. Uh, anyway, it's a detective film. It's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not funny at all. It is definitely a... Um, it is definitely kind of a modern noir. It's a later Fuller film from 1972. And um, it it really still has all of his just relentless energy and kind of idiosyncratic uh, stylistic touches. Uh, a worthwhile film to check out if you are a Samuel Fuller fan. If you are not a Samuel Fuller fan, I would probably recommend some of his other films first. You'd probably want to look at something like uh, Shock Corridor to make sure that you know this is the guy for you. But otherwise, if you're if you're into Fuller, that you can't do wrong with this. It's great. A lot of interesting twists and turns in the plot and. Uh, Really good stuff. Uh, Glenn Corbett is uh, particularly really good as the uh, the lead private eye in this thing. Not an actor who had much of a career a- apart from this role. Really, this is kind of the one that defined him. But uh, boy, I'll tell you, you know, watch. But watch like The Naked Kiss or Shot Corridor first if you haven't seen a fuller film, just to make sure this is your uh, your thing. Oh, definitely. Uh, Shot Corridor is on Criterion DVD. Yeah. Is it? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. So here we go. Now, uh, now here comes the rest. Um, We've got, okay, the, the rest of these films. Um, what's the worst that could happen with Martin Lawrence and Danny DeVito? Uh, boy, this was, uh, this was really kind of misbegotten. Um, Sam Weissman was a promising director at a certain point, and then uh, this kind of uh, pushed him off the rails. I interviewed Sam Weissman at one point, and uh, he, really nice guy. He directed, you know, the, uh, the Mighty Ducks. Sure. Very, uh, very, really nice director. Really sweet guy. And then uh, he started doing stuff like this, and uh, he doesn't have much of a career anymore, and I think it's sad. Uh, this was a, a misfire, but it didn't need to be that big of a misfire. It's just uh, not, not terribly good. Um, then we've got Uptown Girls with Brittany Murphy and Dakota Fanning, a little tiny Dakota Fanning, and a beautiful Brittany Murphy who is now deceased, and I find that all terribly, terribly sad. This was directed by Boaz Yakin who uh, has had an up-and-down career. Uh, Boaz Yakin, by the way, uh, a little bit of trivia, is the person who introduced Quentin Tarantino to Lawrence Bender. Uh, Boaz Yakin did, you know, like the, uh, the Rookie, the uh, Charlie Sheen uh, Eastwood film, and then he kind of got sick of studio stuff, and he came back and started doing indie films, and, you know, he's had a really restless career. Very talented guy. This is not one of his best films, but it's very nicely done. Uh, it's, just, it's just kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the cute girl and the little girl. It's bit of a boilerplate thing uh let's see sibling rivalry with Kirstie Alley it was a uh, kind of the 
the quintessential Carl Reiner co- Castle Rock comedy of the 80s and 90s. This is right in the middle of that in 1990. And it is an absolutely silly film, but in hindsight, it's kind of strangely charming. It's got Carl Reiner's eccentric uh, silliness in it. Kirstie Alley is funny. Bill Pullman is funny. Jamie Gertz is funny. I don't know why everyone just uh, dumped on this film at the time. Not great, but passable. Uh, Fatal Beauty with Whoopi Goldberg is abysmal. I just uh, this is a Tom Holland directed movie. Uh, this is out strictly because you know it's a, it's got Whoopi Goldberg and Sam Elliott, and I I guess there's some cachet to that. But this is just a completely unwatchable film as far as I'm concerned. I just don't understand why this uh, why this was made. It's on here. It is on Blu-ray. So uh, if you have any kind of nostalgia for for Whoopi Goldberg in a really poor you know cop movie from. Uh, 1987 and well, you know, knock yourself out and then lastly here is um, the uh, Blu-ray debut of Costa Gavras's Betrayed which was written by Joe Esterhaus during a particular phase where he was using the same template for all of his movies which includes of course uh, Basic Instinct and Music Box and you know, uh, uh, Jagged Edge they all have the same plot which is uh, A is in love with B and uh, B may or may not be a horrible killer. Uh, A does not believe it, and then in the end it re- it's revealed that, yes, B is a horrible killer, and A is just crestfallen and has to somehow reconcile his or her life to that fact. Every one of those movies, same plot. Betrayed is exactly the same thing. Deborah Winger goes undercover investigating Tom Berenger, uh, who's like a, uh, you know, quite likely a KKK murderer, and uh, it's, a, you know, it's it's a it's a decent film. It's not Costagavras's best film, but it's prob- certainly one of Joe Esterhaus's better implementations of that formula. And uh, the thing that touches us most, as long as we've been talking about people that we've lost, is that uh, Richard Libertini, a uh, very very good friend and a wonderful character actor, uh, has a uh, has a part at the very beginning of this as the uh, as the character, the same character that Eric Bogosian plays in Talk Radio who was actually murdered uh, by a Klansman. Uh, he was a Jewish uh, talk radio host, and he's not, it's not the same name in this. It's not the exact same character, but it's based on that incident. And that murder is what precipitates this film, the rest of which is, of course, fictitious. Wait, you know what else is fictitious? What else? Solar Babies. Yeah. Solar Babies was a uh, another just a horrible film from 1985. This, uh, imagine rollerblades... Uh, not rollerblades. Imagine a, a rollerball with like a hip young cast. Yeah. If it's 1985, Jason Patrick, Jamie Gertz, I used to like her. Um, Peter DeLuise, who I used to hang out with, hang sure. out with as a kid. Sure. Uh, they play these kids who were involved in this futuristic, you know, uh, d- d- sport on wheels, and it's. Uh, I hated this movie. <laughs> I did. I remember this. I, I remember this so well. It, it, the effects were okay. They were Richard Edlund. And this, it was one of those Maurice Jarre scores. You know, we've had this conversation where I like all, not all, because then you prove me wrong. I like most Maurice Jarre orchestral scores. I dislike most Maurice Jarre uh, electronic scores. You, we've talked about this before. You like Witness. You like the know, whole barn, like but you, that's a good score. I know it is a good Come score. On. Anyway, so this thing is just a just, this thing just a stinker. But you know what? For those of a certain age, it, it might be a little bit um, might be a little bit um, nostalgic. Anyway, we also have now. There was a time, folks. It's hard to believe. The time is 1981, and Sally Field is considered a hot piece of ass. Oh my goodness! Did you just say that? <laughs> you know? Have you seen her new movie? Uh, I my, have not. my name is. Uh, uh, my yeah. name is. Uh, I heard it was good. Oh no! It's not. Really, it's not. Oh no. No, 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 no. Is it called? Is it called? Sally Field does this because somebody offered her a lead role, yeah, so why not just pretty do much. it? Yeah, pretty much. No, she's uh, she's an she's an older woman who's working a horrible desk desk job, and she falls in love with the the hot new young guy, and then uh, starts trying to put the moves on him, and tries to become all hip. And it's just movies where older ladies try. Here's the thing: movies where older women try to make themselves young and hip and cool and attractive to a young guy. Um, are so uncomfortable. They make my skin crawl because you're so humiliating the actress. And when it's an actress who I particularly remember when she was young and hot and cool and hip, um, I want to cry. It just it adds insult to injury. The God whole fall. the whole thing is just so it is so upsetting to me. It, it just it's a really depressing movie to watch. I really I, I did not like it at all. 
Well, look, really this depressing. is a film called Backroads, and Backroads is a little bit of a, of a uh, forgotten gem. This was directed by Martin Ritt, uh, who also directed Sally Field, obviously, in um, Norma Ray, to an Oscar in Norma Ray, and Tommy Lee Jones, 1981. Sally Field plays a, uh, she plays a prostitute, and uh, Tommy Lee Jones is a boxer, or used to be a boxer. He gets fired from his job at a car wash, and they go off together on a big road trip, and this was shot by John Alonzo, who shot uh, Chinatown and Scarface. It's got a Henry Mancini score. It's got some real pedigree. You would think this is just uh, a real throwaway programmer, but you know what? Backroads is kind of a nice little movie. I, I did like it. Um, I had forgotten all about it, but Backroads is recommended. Hello, my name is Doris. That's, That's the it. new movie. That's yeah, it. I can't recommend it. I'm sorry. Now, Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane, I, can, I cannot talk about this film because I've only seen about a half hour of it. It has that one scene. No, you no, know no. What let I'm me tell you. I, I don't. I'll tell you why. Because yeah. when I, in nine, this came out in 1976. Yeah. My mother took me to go see this movie. Now I was a tiny person. Yes. In 1976, yes. why she took me to see this movie, I have no idea. <laughs> it freaks and you there out. was a scene. Yes. I was really scared. It's the scene. And there was a scene. No, I don't think it was. I don't think I lasted that long. There was a scene where, like, they open it. Like, someone's at the bottom of the stairs or in a closet or something, and they're all bloody. And I said to my mother, as like a whatever, as a tiny little, why am I in this movie? I'm scared. And so my mother took me out of the film. So we left the theater. And I've still never seen The Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane, which, you know, uh, people like it. It was nominated for a couple Saturn Awards. It's got a good cast. Jodie Foster, of course. She was 13 at the time. Martin so, Sheen. So you're telling me uh, you, you, you freaked out and never watched enough of this movie to get to the hamster scene? No, I've never seen the hamster scene. You've never seen the hamster no. scene. It would traumatize you for life. Now, now, hang on. Now, was the hamster scene late in the film or mid, mid film, early oh, in the film? Oh, boy. I can't remember exactly. Because I all about I remember, mid film. It's about mid Okay, film. I, I was out. All I know is that somebody was murdered oh either, either in a closet or on the bottom of the stairs and I freaked out because I was like I, one years old and I don't, why, no, don't know why my mother took me to see this film I, and I screamed I, and yelled I, I, and she took me out of the theater. So I have not seen it. Oh, the hamster scene is the worst. It really is. It's so, it's so not right. It's so not right. Really? Yeah, it's not right. It shouldn't have. It's it's one. It's just one of those moments in a movie. It, even today, it's just. I'm, I can't. I'm sorry. I'm too squeamish about it. It's not good. <laughs> I feel like I want to know what it is. Well, no, anyway, I'll, that... I'll tell you what it is. It's, it, it's a tor- they, 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 the, the guy kills a hamster with a cigarette. It's horrible. Nah, who hasn't done that? <laughs> okay. Oh, it's just. No, but it is. It's truly terrible. It is truly terrible. It is. It is one of the most unpleasant things to watch I've ever seen. Anyway, carry on. Anyway, uh, the Manhattan Project um, is a film that was. Uh, Directed and co-written by Marshall Brickman, so you would think oh, it's I got some Marshall serious. And look, he co-wrote Annie Hall, he co-wrote yeah. Sleeper, he co-wrote Manhattan, he wrote Jersey Boys. I mean, this guy is like, uh, you know, this, this guy is kind of a heavyweight. Now, is it a good film? It's okay. It's with John Lithgow and uh, Cynthia uh, Nixon. It's sort of part of that whole like war games thing, where like you, know, you get like the high school science kid, and he builds a bomb as a joke. And then, of course, it winds up, uh, you know, triggering this, you know, t- t- you know, ticking time bomb sort of uh, plot. So, you know, uh, it was I much prefer War Games to something like uh, the Manhattan Project. But I understand, in terms of context, uh, the time in which it was made. This was this was a time when uh, it was sort of like computers were just kind of happening for kids. There was still some Cold War fears out there, and Manhattan Project again, sort of in this kind of like War Games mode. So. Uh, it's okay. Jill Eikenberry is also in it, and uh, John Mahoney from uh, the the sitcom with the with the dog and the whatever name is. I forgot. What, what, what was that John Mahoney sitcom? Uh, 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 Frasier. Uh, Frasier. Thank you. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, I'd pass on this and uh, go with um, War Games. Although you know what, I do love Marshall Brickman, but most of his great work, of course, was with Woody Hall. Uh, Woody Hall. Woody Annie, Allen. Uh, Woody Allen. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, three more from the uh, Kino Studio Classics line here. The Magnetic Monster is a bit of an absolute straight-up riot. This is directed by Kurt Siadmach, who is uh, who is a you know a pretty standard uh, studio director. Cranked out a lot of stuff in the fifties and the sixties. Uh, this is from 1953. Straight up nuclear era paranoia, uh, monster exploitation stuff. Uh, it's, it, this is an absolute riot. Basically, uh, like in all of these things, a monster is created by radiation. It's not Godzilla because it's an American film. So you, uh, 
you, you get, in this case, you get a monster that is uh, created by uh, radiation that every 12 hours it doubles in size. And, uh, it, of course, sit in the middle of nowhere, and it's just... Uh, I have something that doubles in size. Yeah, this, this thing is just absolutely a hoot. It's completely ridiculous. You didn't it's, even listen to me. Yeah, I know. You have something that doubles in size. I was not going to go there because you're working <laughs> blue, and I'm not going to I'm not gonna work blue with you. Anyway, very, very funny nuclear-era uh, silliness. Uh, much more famous, A Kiss Before Dying with Robert Wagner, Jeffrey Hunter, Virginia Leith, and Joanne Woodward. Uh, this is from 1956. Beautiful color. Uh, really good performances, a uh, and directed quite well by uh, Garrett Oswald, who never really had much of a career after that. Um, but this is this is the one that will, that works, and uh, this is one of those you know uh, kill, serial killer movies or or murderer movies, probably more accurate. Uh, about uh, you know how can he be a killer? He's just uh, he's so he's so good looking. And uh, Robert Wagner just uh, really ripped it up in this one. He went off the edge and uh, really took a chance and pays off. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, Jeffrey Hunter, of course, is also very good, as is Joanne Woodward, who's a little bit wasted. But, um, you know, it's, uh, the, I guess you could say this is maybe the uh, psycho killer version of A Place in the Sun. It's sort of, what if, what if A Place in the Sun, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't such a, you know, just sweet, nice, accidental. What, what if he wasn't, uh, he didn't kill... Uh, uh, Shelley Winters just uh, sort of, you know, accidentally or out of... I, I shouldn't even say accidentally. I mean, I'm, am I giving up too much about A Place in the Sun? Pretty am much. I spoiling that movie uh, for people? Kind of. Okay, never mind. All right, well, a, a more malicious version of A Place in the Sun. Anyway, uh, and then uh, Steel Justice. In a world. Steel Justice. Uh, Martin Cove is a really interesting actor. Uh, most of you know him from the uh, Karate Kid, uh, where he's just a you know just square jawed heavy. Uh, in, <coughs> in, in that, uh, but you know he he actually people tried to make him a bit of a, uh, a an action star later in the eighties in nineteen eighty seven when he starred in Steel Justice, which is a pretty terrible movie. But uh, you know it's like a wannabe Rambo. It, it, it doesn't really work, but it's it's got a kind of kitschy silliness in it, and it's got a whole. Uh, a whole kind of Asian organized crime angle in Los Angeles, and it doesn't really make any sense. But really good supporting roles by uh, Celia Ward and Ronnie Cox and Joe Campanella. They, they, they round it out. So Martin Cove can't really carry a movie, but you know you put enough good people around him, and if you, you know if you if you don't mind the fact that it's a it's a Rambo ripoff and utterly pointless, you can you can probably get a little bit of fun out of it. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Um, and let's see, Mark. Why don't we? Why don't we do it in the road? We'll get we'll get into some uh, new-ish movies here in just a moment. But I want to make mention really quickly another couple of Flicker Alley Blu-rays that are out. Um, Sidney Alcott's Timothy's Quest and uh, Robert Frost and Alfred A. Knopf's Poet and Publisher. Uh, these are both from the Black Hawk Films collection. And uh, definitely worth checking out. Uh, David Shepard recently received an award from LAFCA for his work on behalf of film restoration. And these are both from his collection, the Blackhawk Films collection. And uh, Timothy's Quest is a silent film from 1922 that is uh, quite wonderful if you love silent films. I recognize that a lot of our listeners are not really into the silent, uh, the silent era. But it is, uh, if you want to see one of, like a classic Depression-era silent film in the uh, Mary Pickford vein that deals with the plight of orphans and, uh, and their, their inclement living conditions, uh, it almost doesn't get any better than this. You just don't have Mary Pickford in it. But otherwise, it's many of the same, uh, many of the same stuff. A little bit kind of like a Mary Pickford film meets uh, City Lights, only without Pickford and Chaplin, and it doesn't suffer for it. It's wonderful, very, very realistic. And then uh, the poet and publisher, uh, Robert Frost, Alfred A. Knopf, it includes two films... One is Robert Frost, which took uh, about a year to shoot in 1961, and the other is a publisher is known by the company he keeps, uh, which is all about Alfred A. Knopf, the publisher. And uh, each of these is about a half an hour long, um, and uh, really an interesting pair of archival films from the uh, Black Hawk Films collection, two very, very interesting uh, profiles of... Uh, of significant figures from about the 1960-1961 time period. Uh, Robert Frost is the most interesting one of the two of these. It's a, really a, an extraordinary film, uh, really a, a great short 
you know, documentary uh, profile of an amazing figure in American uh, literature and uh, poetry. And then Al Alfred Knopf, of course, you know, we, we know him basically by the books that he published. And uh, this also is a really, really interesting uh, behind the scenes look at the man, the name behind the name, behind the publishing powerhouse in his uh, in his environment, uh, you know, just being who he is and talking about the uh, the writers that he made famous. And we often forget behind every right, great writer is a great publisher. So that also from the Blackhawk Films collection, a wonderful release uh, from uh, Flickr Alley. Flickr Alley uh, is just they're killing it these days, and they have you know they have a streaming service too. You can you can watch a lot of their library stuff on uh, streaming. It's uh, Flickr Alley is really. They're, they're moving. I love what? it. What? Speaking of, we haven't talked about this. It's not going to launch until the fall, and we obviously have no uh, no great insights into what it's going to be all about. But what do you think about the new uh, Turner Classic Movies and Criterion uh, streaming service that's going to basically give Voodoo a kick in the pants? Well, it's Hulu that loses that. Or Hulu, that I mean Hulu, sorry. Well, yes. Hulu is the one that loses out of that. That's a big loss for I Hulu because a lot of people subscribe to Hulu only for Criterion. But I love Criterion and I love Turner Classic Movies. I mean, really, it's it's, really, a, it's a to die for pairing. It really I mean, is. I mean, that's like I, I it, that that's just amazing. I mean, it all depends on what it'll, how it'll be priced. But even if it's like nine ninety nine a month, hell yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. Look, you know, yes, Criterion has license agreements with all these great films. But part of what I love about Criterion is the extras. And the booklet, and the you know seeing it on Blu-ray where the resolution yes. is as good as it's going to get. Yeah. A lot of times the older films are 2K, not 4K, yes. but still. So yes, I, I get it's a great pairing. It's a match made in heaven. But I'd still rather watch a Criterion Blu-ray than watch. I agree. Something streamed, a Criterion movie streamed. Yep, I agree. Uh, you know, you'll like my mother is uh, is one of those post Rosemary's Baby thrillers where pregnancy is just uh, it's a it's a horror show. And uh, in this one, you, we, this is uh, Patty Duke, the late wonderful Patty Duke, uh, plays a pregnant widow who goes to meet uh, her mother-in-law in Minnesota, and uh, it ain't what she hoped it would be. Um, really, really creepy. Rosemary Murphy is terrific. Richard Thomas uh, is creepy in this as well. Uh, just around the, from 1972, right around the time, I guess, the Waltons probably started. So uh, this is right before he became John Boy and cleaned up that image a little bit but uh yeah this is this is sharp this is a sharp little film directed by lamont johnson who of course was a big big tv director uh throughout his career but this is uh, a feature film from 1972 released by universal now released by scream factory division of shout factory you'll like my mother a long forgotten but wonderful patty duke performance that even though derivative of rosemary's baby still very good and worth recommending not worth recommending is the choice. And the reason why the choice is not worth recommending is because I'm a man and this movie was based on a Nicholas Sparks novel. Aww. And that means that if you love The Notebook and if you love Safe Haven, then stop listening to this podcast because you're not a man. Yeah. Exactly. No, this thing is, even by these standards set by Nicholas Sparks films, this thing is just way too melodramatic and just too formulaic. I just think this thing is just a big downer. Uh, Benjamin Walker and Teresa Palmer star in this thing. And, uh, you know, they he's a bachelor who never thought he'd get married, and he meets uh, the hot Teresa Palmer, so they get married, but then there's a secret and a choice and a, a drama, and, of course, it's Nicholas Sparks. So you already know what you're getting when you see one of these films, but uh, I just found this thing predictable. All the romantic movie cliches and tropes are all there. It's all very derivative, and I just think that you've got to have a real appetite for Nicholas Sparks' movies to really be interested in the choice. Um, good Blu-ray, though. It's got uh, deleted scenes, audio commentary with the director and Benjamin Walker. So, uh, yeah, the choice. I'd pass. Yeah, and you know what? You still tried to convince me that uh, that was a good movie, and I disagree, but, you know, <laughs> you know I don't like any of his movies. Well, that's the thing. It's like when you, when people were told that the new Michael Moore film was called Where to Invade Next, they all rolled their eyes and said, oh, my God, Where to Invade Next? He hates Bush. He hates yeah. That's not what this film is. No. This film is a much sort of – That would really have been better. Is, it really is a gentler Michael Moore film. This yeah. one is where he goes to these different countries and he finds aspects of their culture and their politics that they do, quote, unquote, better than America, and he yeah. wants to take them home. Now – does he cherry pick? Yes, he does. 
He usually always does. But but, but he, that's okay because it's like it, it, here, it, here are my here are my gripes with all with the film. First of all, his filmmaking technique has not improved in in over twenty years. Oh, he, so what? It still looks like he's walking around with a Super Eight camera. He he's is. not even trying. He's, he's a not, big schlubby guy. He, he's not even trying. He his second problem. His hygiene has disintegrated. His hair is long. He's, he's got to be in his sixties at this he's, point. He's, he's, but he's just so sloppy. He's so he's what? Just, it's Michael Moore. What do you want uh, him to be? Is, 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 what, what was he? A, 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 a Daniel Craig on the cover of Spectre? But come on, man! You're 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 so not. You, you, all you're making fun of right now is how he looks. Well, what about what the what, film is saying? First of all, he is the least telegenic person in the history of movies, and he, it's like he decided here. He's like, I think I'm going to push that to eleven, and now he's even more disgusting. It's like, for, for, gosh, man, come on, make an effort. Like, put that, on a, at least put on a clean shirt when you wake up. That, Something. That stop, being, not, stop being. Stop being okay. Michael. You're asking him to stop being Michael Moore. Basically, what you're doing. yeah. And then here's my other problem. It's he 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 posits as if he's some kind of journalist. Well, what he, here's what he does. He asks like unbelievably leading questions. So he'll ask them. So you hate America, right? And they'll basically go. He doesn't no. say you hate America. No, but America. but this is but this is like an ex- extreme example. He goes, so you hate America, right? He they, they go, well, no, not really. I really like America, and so forth and so on and so on. And then he'll go. So what you're saying is America is the worst country in the world. He doesn't and do then, that. And then and then you know they'll 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 go. You're well, not really. He goes. Thanks for agreeing with me. Basically, that's the way the questioning goes. No, no, no. He, he draws his own conclusions no, no. that are completely unrelated to anything that they say. No, no. What he's what he's saying is that is is that there are countries that do certain things better than yeah, we but do, his, and it's okay. But his Q and A with them, he the conclusions that he draws. The words he puts in their mouths have nothing to do See, with the things I, these people actually say. I, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that that all American schools have to have as as, as as good a lunch program as the very limited <laughs> amount that they have of schools that they have in France that have like four star yeah. chefs cooking for the kids. Yeah. I'm not saying that you know that that's how it's got to be in America, but it just makes you think. There are some interesting things I can see, like the the guys in the Norwegian prison, which is essentially like a, it's like a Motel Six. You know, they don't, they're, they're like, no, we don't have rain, anal rape or prison riots. We enjoy being here, and I got a job waiting for me when I get out. And you just think, oh, my gosh, why can't we do that? Well, it's because we're a nation of 300 million people. And in Norway, once you get out, pretty much anything that you do, you'll be recognized because everyone in Norway knows everybody else in Norway. That's, and, you know, or they'll exile I, you to Lapland where you'll have to sit around with reindeer and Laplanders. And, I, you know. I, I think it's really the spirit of what it's trying to say, not that – we should actually pay for everybody's yeah. college education in America. I just wish he'd take himself out of his movies. That's the problem. He's just he well, he's complaining presence. about his clothing. All he does is complaining about his clothing. He's yes, he's worst. a big schlubby guy. He's the worst. Who I, I, I met a couple times. I had yeah. a coffee with him once. I mean, because I used to produce him on uh, yeah. later when yeah. I was on later with Greg Kinnear, and I liked him a lot. You know, he's a fun guy. To, he's yeah. a fun guy with interesting opinions. But yeah, yeah. I, I think that we need to look at the spirit of it, not the actual letter of it. Oh, what has happened to Alejandro Amenabar? I just don't get it, uh, Alejandro. Manabar was like the man. Remember, he did, you know, he did uh, the, uh, the the uh, the the film that eventually became. Oh gosh, why am I drawing a blank on the title? That would uh, eventually become Vanilla Sky. Oh yeah, the open your eyes. Open your eyes. So open your eyes. Amazing, wonderful movie. Incredible. Even though Vanilla Sky sucked. And then he did the others, and you're like, oh my gosh, he did his you know debut with Tom Cruise and his English language Hollywood debut, and it's, it was so good and it was so cool and moody. And then he did the uh, the Sea Inside, won, won an Oscar. It's such an amazing movie, it's such a beautiful film. And then and you're like, oh, this guy is on fire. And then it, like it all falls apart. And now he's doing stuff like Regression, which you know, fair enough. It's a it's okay. It's not horrible. Ethan Hawke, Emma Watson, good cast. Uh, but it just it just feels like he's going through the motions now. It just it's just very kind of procedural thriller, standard kind of psychological wannabe Hitchcockian thriller, and uh, it, it it doesn't you know it's it's not like he's gone the M Night Shyamalan route, but he's he definitely needs to get back on track. This guy I thought was going to be you know he won an Oscar. I thought this guy was going to be on track to be like the man. He would he would you know he'd just start killing it film after film. He was so talented, and it's like Adam McGoyan, you know? I know. Just, what happened to him? I just, I don't know. But anyway, Regression, it's out there on Blu-ray. Um, Ultraviolet as well. Got, uh, you know, a few featurettes on it. Um, if you're an Amenabar completist, he wrote and directed it. I guess, you know, it's worth checking out to see what he's, uh, what he's up to. But he just, he needs to do better, and he can do better, and I hope he does. You know what's not better? The Boy. Oh, dear. A completely silly movie about a... Uh, 
girl who has to do a thing, take care of a boy. Yeah, but he's actually a life-size doll. Uh oh, got to care for a life-size doll. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And more uh, doll movies. They they freak me out. Really? Too creepy. Too many really? creepy doll movies. Yeah. Oh, because because the because ba- you no know, because you're expecting the the doll to suddenly like pop to life and it's give you whole, like a shock scare. It's the whole Twilight Zone thing. Too too much creepy doll stuff. You know this. Uh, I, I believe that that this doll's grandmother. It's talking Tina. Yeah, I'm sure. Anyway, so uh, the whole idea is that this ba- the, the, this family has a doll because their their son had died many years earlier, and this is their way to cope was to have this life size eight year old boy looking doll in their house, and so this girl has got to take care of the doll. So, uh, what happens when this uh, young American uh, cutie uh, goes to this uh, English village to take care of a, 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 a toy doll? You'll find out when you don't rent the boy. Mm-hmm. It's just a bunch of silliness. And then uh, we've got a, uh, a couple relatively interesting ones to wrap out here with. Uh, East Side Sushi is another one of those movies about food, kind of like Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, and every other movie about food and chefs and mostly Martha that uh, just make you hungry when you watch them. Uh, that's kind of how I felt about this. Uh, basically, uh, uh, here's the deal. East Side Sushi... It's about a uh, young Latina woman, single mom, who is an amazing cook, uh, but she's never had a restaurant. She just uh, has been kind of a, you know, a, a roadside cart vendor person for a long time. And now she takes a job at a restaurant and uh, tries to get her life on track, tries to get some security. But you see, it's a Japanese restaurant. And so, you know, she's not Japanese, so she tries to be a little bit creative with the sushi, and actually, you wind up getting all kinds of really interesting culinary culture clash. So, yes, it's a little bit of Mostly Martha in there. If you remember Mostly Martha, German chef, Italian guy, you know, and there's a little, you know, you get that thing tangling up. And uh, this is a little bit of the same thing, but um, it, is a, uh, it is done. It is handled very sweetly and very sensitively, and it's a low-budget independent film, but doesn't look it. This is from Samuel Goldwyn. And uh, decent cast, good direction. Uh, you know, I love it when good filmmakers, Anthony Lucero is the, uh, the director and the writer. I love it when these uh, filmmakers are able to take a very little amount of money and they're able to turn into something really, really sharp. I like this better, for example, than, the, uh, than Chef, which was directed oh, by... I like Chef. It's charming. Like Chef. The John Favreau film. Yeah, but, uh, you know, he's, it, it, this is better than Chef. It's got a little sharper, as far as food movies from the past few years. So that is... Uh, East Side Sushi, and then here's the big mama. We've talking about people who disappeared, who were big deals in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Peter Greenaway. What the hell happened to Peter um, Greenaway? And when is, is a Wife, Thief, Cook, Lover coming yeah. out on the Blu-ray? Oh, I, 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 I love that movie. That is a disgusting film. But the anyway, uh, anyway, here's Peter Greenaway. He is finally back with uh, the movie Eisenstein. Uh, naturally, of course, he makes movies with really commercial titles. And the title here is Eisenstein in Guanajuato. Uh, My ex-girlfriend Brenda was from Guanajuato. Really? Yes. So you know how to pronounce Guanajuato. Guanajuato. You realize I practiced for about 20 minutes before the show to make sure that I wouldn't screw that up on the first pronunciation. My ex-girlfriend was from Guanajuato. Well, okay. Well, Eisenstein in Guanajuato. And uh, in case you didn't know this, uh, in 1931, the famous uh, Russian filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein, also a great theorist who we all had to read in film school endlessly, a man who could write the longest run-on sentences of any human being who has ever lived. I kid you not. It would be like Eisenstein's essays. You, you, turn it, you turn the page like four times before you find a period. It, it's insane. Uh, and by then you've completely lost touch with his stream of consciousness. But anyway, in 1931... Uh, he went to go shoot a movie in Mexico. And uh, this is effectively about that period. And it is done in Greenaway's very unusual style. It gets very inside Eisenstein's head, and it is, it is very fantastical and weird and strange and eccentric in all the ways that uh, Eisenstein's films are. It is a not, not a naturalistic expression of the actual uh, period, but it certainly expresses his love of Eisenstein through his own style, and it is, I am not a Greenaway fan, but I will say this certainly uh, pokes your head in some, uh, some unusual and... Uh, I guess I won't say welcome ways, but it, uh, it it's like it's like it it gets you thinking. Uh, we'll leave it at that. And then, um, Mark, have you ev- ev- evacuated or are you coming back? Ah, yes. So, uh, wrapping things out, I just want to make mention of a, a handful of anime here. I got some uh, cool anime. We got uh, Azazel, you're being summoned um, from uh, Lucky Penny. 
which is uh, part of the, uh, the Right Stuff line. Right Stuff uh, releases all the Lucky Penny anime. And uh, this stuff is just straight up strange. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like uh, Pokemon meets film noir. It's very weird. Lots of demons and lots of procedural stuff. I don't quite get it. Uh, more Mobile Suit Gundam stuff in Mobile Suit Gundam UC Unicorn, which is also from Right Stuff. Uh, this is the uh, Sunrise Library part of Right Stuff. Uh, if you love all that Mobile Suit stuff, I, I, it gets a little tiresome for me. Uh, Ghost in the Shell, the new movie. They are, of course, this is not the live action one that is uh, controversially casting uh, um, Scarlett Johansson in a role that uh, people feel should be an Asian actor. This is an animated Ghost in the Shell new movie. Uh, beautiful animation, still incomprehensible. Also comes with uh, Ultraviolet, a uh, Blu ray DVD Ultraviolet combo set. Uh, really, really well animated. You're not big on Ghost in the Shell. You're the one that like, dis- dislikes all the bleeps and the bloops. Oh, uh, yeah, it's not my thing. Yeah. Uh, season 2 of Data Live 2 in a Blu-ray DVD combo set. No ultraviolet on this one, but, uh, you know, it's, as far as, like, little pixie, uh, cyberpunk, futuristic, feminist, superhero, space-going uh, titillation, this, is, uh, this fits the bill, I'll tell you. Lots of, lots of cute pixies and great costumes and, uh, you know, battling aliens and being aliens, and still none of it makes a lot of sense, but it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Good animation. And uh, Makin Key 2, the complete series. Uh, more cute girls, more titillation, big boobs, big swords. It's a thing in Japan, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I, I suppose I, I get it. But, uh, you know, there's, there's some kind of fetishistic thing going on in that country that I still struggle to understand. And then the last few, we have a couple uh, titles from the Magic Users Club, which is is wacky and silly and has a certain juvenile uh, following. Magic Users Club TV series and uh, OVA series, OP series. Um, quickly before our time completely goes kaput, this is a lovely box set. Eden of the East, premium edition, the complete series uh, with the King of Eden and uh, Paradise Lost. Um, this is this is not uh, slouchy anime by any chance. Uh, this is not even in the in the standard anime style. This is uh, from Funimation, but this is really some of the most creative animation you will ever see in, from Japan. I almost don't even want to call it anime because it really does live stylistically completely outside all of the uh, all of the, uh, the, the, the 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 tropes that are usually associated with it. Uh, basically, it's a it's an uh, amnesia story about a guy who uh, wakes up completely blanked uh, outside the White House with a a cell phone in one hand and a gun in the other. And from there, you get just an amazing, amazing saga that transpires. It's really quite extraordinary on many, many levels. That's a beautiful, beautiful box set. And then uh, we also have new editions of One Piece, classic uh, One Piece collection number 15. That uh, pirate phantasmia continues to go. And then fairy tale, T-A-I-L, in uh, its uh, Blu-ray DVD combo set number 19. And then lastly, the strangely popular show Lost Girl, which has uh, consistently been released uh, by Funimation on DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, Lost Girl, the final chapters, is out. Seasons 5 and 6. This show uh, I, I continues to have kind of a strange appeal to people. It's like the dark edge of a CW show, so it um, it's better than a CW show, but nonetheless, it uh, it strictly has a cult following. So all of that is also new to DVD and Blu-ray. Mark, we are done. We're done. We're done. Goodbye. Bye.